All right, so uh, today we are continue, continuing with transformers and getting into GANs. Um, to start off, a couple of matters of business. I've taken a look at uh, about two thirds of the project proposals so far and given feedback on those. Um, and I should be done by the end of today. So um, definitely recommend you take a look at that feedback. I think, um, yeah, I tried to give feedback that would set you up for better success in your project. So um, yeah, there's that. Um, lab seven, Transformer Lab due this Saturday. Any questions on that lab so far? Uh, if you missed it, there, uh, there were some deprecations in the current version of the lab spec and it has been updated on Learning Suite. So if you downloaded the lab before Monday at 5 p.m., um, re-download it and those packages should work now. Uh, thanks to Matthew McKinney for, for fixing those for us. Yeah, Dane. Sequence length by embedding dimension. Yep. Mask has a sequence length dimension of one compared to anything else. That should not be true. The mask should be L by L. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about the implementation details of how the, of the num, so it shouldn't have any dimension. Uh, it should have a length of one in the D dimension. It should be L by L. And then I'm not sure if we have N copies of the same mask across the batch, um, or if you just have one single mask, one, one single mask that is just copied across the batch. Um, but yeah, the, the mask itself, the important information is just L by L because that tells you which tokens pay attention to each other. Yes, each, each, each sequence should have its own. Hmm? Yep. All right, so today uh, we're going to talk about some variations on the transformer architecture. So to start off with, we have BERT. Uh, by, I think BERT stands for bi-directional um, encoder representations for transformers. So basically the whole idea behind BERT is that we don't necessarily need, we, we don't necessarily need the full transformer architecture. Um, the original authors of the transformer paper introduced an architecture in the broadest context that had both an encoder and a decoder. But uh, the authors of the BERT paper recognized that uh, in many cases, you may only need an encoder. And so that's what they did. Um, so this is the whole idea behind BERT is we want to learn representations of our tokens. We want to learn deep bi-directional uh, contextual representations for each token in a sequence. And in order to do that, we don't necessarily need a decoder. Um, and so the question is, how can we learn good representations of, of text? Um, one option, well, yeah, and I guess I'll, I'll open up that question to you. If you were to uh, suppose we have an unlet labeled data set of text, can you think of any way that we could, so we're looking for something similar to what we got used the VGG network for, a feature extractor. So a VGG is, the VGG network was trained on an image classification task, and then we used it subsequently for the style transfer lab as a feature extractor, where it extracted useful feature, features about uh, style and content of an image. Um, so we wanna do a similar thing with text, However, we want to do it in an unsupervised setting. We don't have any labels. And so the question is, is that even possible? Can we learn useful representations of our data without labels? I'll give you a hint, the answer is yes. Um, think, think about it for a second. Can you think of any ideas of a training objective that could help you learn, uh, yeah, some perhaps useful representations 
of, of text. The name of one, is, one of them is on the slide right there. Um, yeah, Dane, you want to give it, give it a shot? That's a thought. So uh, with an encoder decoder architecture, training it to just replicate the input, uh, that, that's an interesting idea. Um, I think uh, you would have to mask the input some way so that um, it doesn't just learning, uh, because you could just learn an identity map where you just learn um, a copy from input to output. And I, I, I doubt that that would produce useful features. But yeah, I think you're onto something. So if we were to modify your idea a little bit and say, instead of um, predicting, the, predicting yourself, predicting the next token, given a mask that prevents the next token from seeing itself, that could be a way to use an unlabeled text data set to um, perhaps learn some features. Basically, the idea is in order to learn to predict the next token, your network would have to uh, learn structure of language um, in order to predict that next token. So that is one idea of, so predicting the next token is an, un, an unsupervised or self-supervised uh, objective for text. Any other ideas? Yeah. That's a thought. So having have predicting the tokens on either side of a, of a token, that's, that's another, another interesting idea. Yeah, the, the cool thing about, uh, and so we're, we're getting into this idea that we would call self-supervised learning, where our labels are extracted from an unlabeled data set. And so in this case, we're using text and we're generating our labels by just shifting our outputs to the right. Um, Another, I'll, I'll throw out a couple of other, a, a couple of other objectives. What if you, if you, what if you took a, a, say, Wikipedia article, and you passed in two sentences from that Wikipedia article, and you asked the network to t tell you which one came before the other. That task is called entailment, and it it requires learning some semantic information about the text in order for the network to learn which of them goes before the other. Um, the self-supervised objective that BERT uses is called masked language modeling. And this is what it looks like. You pass a sentence into, the, into a transformer encoder, but you have a, but you substitute one of the tokens with a mask token. Um, which is its own special token that doesn't correspond to the actual letters mask, but it, it, it's its own self-contained token representing, uh, we don't know what this input is. And we are going to train the network to fill in the blank, to predict the, mat, the identity of that masked token. And it turns out that in doing this objective, um, the network learns to extract useful and useful representations of contextual representations of text without ever having to, do, to introduce a labeled training objective. Any questions on that? Okay, so the, the, the question is, what would those features then be useful for? Well, um, you can then take these features and then uh, Suppose you have a much smaller labeled data set. You want to uh, classify, let's say, let's say, um, yeah, so let's say you have speeches given by presidents and you want to predict who wrote this, the speech or uh, conference talks and you want to, to predict this, the speaker from a conference talk. You, that may not be a large enough data set in order to perform well on your task. So what you would do is you would start with a pre-trained uh, pre neural network, a pre-trained BERT network, for example, 
and then you would pre-train on all of Wikipedia or all of the internet and um, basically develop really good representations. And then from there, you find, do what's called fine tuning, where you now switch the task. You add a single layer at, at the end of the network to, for your new task, which is predict classifying which, uh, who gave the conference talk. And then your, your network just has to learn, like it just has to make it the last 10 yards to uh, learn that new task rather than learning that new task from scratch. Um, and so that's called pre-training and fine tuning. And it is uh, a, theme, a theme that you'll see kind of come back over and over. Um, any questions on that idea of pre-training and fine tuning? Yeah. We started with the pre-trained VGG. Yeah, so you're totally right that we used a pre-trained network in the style transfer. We did not fine tune it though, because we never, we never further modified the weights of that network. So this would be like exactly what you said, taking the pre-trained VGG network and then fine tuning it for like classifying species of birds or something like that. Um, yeah, Grant, you freeze the rest of the weights. Um, it's optional, but generally we see, tend to see better performance when you don't freeze the weights. Okay, so that's BERT. This is GPT the generative uh, pre-trained model. So uh, again, this is a, uh, uh, a model that's used for feature extraction. Um, and this one, however, is a decoder only architecture. And we are going to, to pre-train it using Dane's uh, suggested training objective, which is uh, well, the modified version of it, which is predicting the next token. And so the idea is uh, we take his input uh, sequence and then predict that sequence shifted to the right. And if you think, think about it, for that kind of task, it's a many-to-many -many task where um, the, each of those sequences is of the same length and there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between each of your inputs and outputs. That's to be contrasted with a many-to-many -many task where you have different lengths of inputs and outputs like language translation. So uh, the predicting the next token objective, we have a one-to-one -one correspondence so we can use just a decoder, or, uh, uh, yeah, just a transformer decoder architect. And we train it to predict the next token and um, they then again, fine tuned it for various different tasks such as multiple choice uh, question answering, and ended up getting pretty good results. But that was just kind of a first experiment uh, because then they scaled it up and came out with GPT-2. Uh, yeah, question, Jaden. You said that it's, uh... yeah. no. So the original training um, is just predicting the next token. Uh, the fine tuning is on entailment, and this is how it works. Yeah, we can go in a little a little more in in detail on this. So for this entailment task, we're going to introduce a couple of special tokens. Well, we'll, we'll have a start token, we'll have a delimiting token, and we'll have an extraction token. And all of the and so we will pass in all as input to this. Um, to this GPT model, um, the start token followed by the first sentence, followed by, by the delimiter token, followed by the second sentence, followed by a token saying, okay, now it's time for you to tell me whether they are in the correct order or reversed. And um, so basically we, we pass that entire task as input to the network and ask it to predict a token uh, relating to, um, yeah, which, which which sentence came first? So by reading that. Yeah, this is after after we've already trained it on text prediction. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
Yeah, so GPT-2 scales up GPT. And uh, turns out that just by scaling up this model, uh, it gets a lot better to the point where we don't even need fine tuning for a lot of tasks. So the, this is a list of questions and answers that um, the network was not fine tuned at all to predict. Simply by predicting the next token, it has learned to answer many of these questions. So who wrote the book, The Origin of Species? Charles Darwin. And, and the, the network, so you prompt it with, who wrote the book of the or, origin of species? And you ask it to complete the sentence, and it gives you Charles Darwin. You ask it, uh, what is the most common blood type in Sweden? It predicts A, that's unfortunately incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> Um, nuclear power plant, plant that blew up in Russia, Chernobyl. Uh, I guess that's kind of correct. It was in the USSR, but uh, we'll, we'll we'll give it we'll give it credit credit on that one. Um, yeah, and so um, you can see that in general it tends to do pretty well on general knowledge, but when you get to more specific knowledge, like yeah, the most common blood type in a country, it, it doesn't do quite as well. But kind of uh, fascinating that um, purely by training on text, this network can start to learn common sense information. Um, and so we're and then so there is uh, one more iteration of GPT that has come out uh, since then. Yes, question. Okay, all right. So and that is called GPT three. GPT-3 takes this idea of prompting the network with questions and takes it one, one step further and where we are going to prompt the network not just with questions, but with entire tasks rather than, so now instead of fine tuning this network for multiple choice answering or whatever, we are just going to provide a either, um, a few examples, one example, or no examples, just a description of the task and see how well the network does. And so, for example, we would prompt GPT-3 with this following task. Translate English to French, sea otter, lutra de mar, uh, peppermint, menthe poivre, um, plush giraffe, giraffe fluche, cheese and then asking it to translate. And it turns out that without ever having um, trained on the English to French translation task, uh, the network is able to translate from English to French simply by being prompted to do so. Um, so they do the few shot task, the one shot task, and the zero shot task where they describe the task and don't even give any, any examples and show that as you continue to scale the network, um, it becomes better and better, even at zero shot tasks. Uh, yeah, what, what what's your thought? Great question, yeah. Can this do just language or can it also do like integrate this, this, this equation? They actually uh, tested on math in the paper. If you look at the GPT-3 paper and yeah, found that these models were able to do like arithmetic and uh, multiplication. I'm guessing they could probably do some pretty basic integration. Um, but yeah, I think you're starting to grasp like kind of the power of these language models. Like what if you trained a language model on um, math papers uh, trying to prove the Riemann hypothesis and asked it to produce what it, to, to give its own opinion, you know? Um, yeah, so I think I, I personally am of the, the opinion that uh, as the, these models tend to continue to improve, we will see a lot of uh, inspiration for uh, scientific research coming out of, uh, coming out of the, these models that are trained on, on research papers. So yeah, pretty cool stuff. Any other thoughts on GPT? Yeah.
Yeah. Wow, there you go. That's pretty cool. Yeah, so yeah, seeing the, the power of scaling. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, Max. Yes, uh-huh, yeah. So um, yeah, it was trained on text from the internet. So there's text of all different languages on the internet, probably more English than any, anything else. Um, but there is French there as well. And maybe some French translation in there, probably not a lot of it though. And so the kind of amazing thing to think is that it trained on English text and trained on French text, text probably not without any pairs of translation, and yet learned uh, basically just through contextual representations that certain words in English corresponded with certain words in French. Yeah, kind of amazing. All right, so um, this is just for your knowledge. Um, there are many other variants of, of um, transformers that have come out since then. Um, BERT and GPT were kind of the pioneers in these pre-trained transformers, uh, but there have been, yeah, lots of efforts to improve them. These are a couple of their names. Um, also something that I would be remiss not to tell you about is the Hugging Face uh, Transformers open source uh, uh, code, code repository. This is, uh, if you, yeah, the, the, the name of the company is the Hugging Face Emoji. Um, but they, yeah, they have basically assembled an entire library of source code for um, these transformer architectures with similar interfaces to all of them. And, um, and also a huge number of pre-trained models. So you can find a GPT that's trained on English, a GPT trained on French, a GPT trained on Japanese, Swahili, uh, and probably like the top 100 most common languages in the world. Um, you can also probably find a GPT trained on music. Um, so definitely checking out the Hugging Face Transformers uh, library or uh, repository is definitely uh, encouraged and you may find something that you can use in your final project. Okay, that's from GPT-3. Yeah, so uh, let's talk about ethics a little bit. So the societal impact of human quality text. We've, we saw in the beginning of the class, uh, probably a more fun, less harmless application of GPT-3, uh, AI Dungeon, that, that demo that we did the first day of class uh, is built on top of GPT-3 and is a fun game, a fun kind of uh, text-based adventure game. Uh, however, you can imagine uh, these, highly human realistic text uh, models being used for less positive purposes. Can you think of any uh, possible issues with uh, being able to generate human quality text? Yeah, Jaden. Mm -hmm. Totally, yeah, that's a great example of people taking things that were made for good and using them for bad. And I think that there's a real lesson in that in uh, adversarial thinking, um, trying to think as you are going out into the world and building your awesome uh, neural networks, um, thinking about if someone with malicious intent had access to my model, what is the worst thing they could do with it? Um, I think that's, that's a, a great lesson. Yeah, what, what, other, what other potential misuses can you think of for GPT? Next generation models. Yeah, Jacob, what do you think?
totally trying to stir up contention between uh, between governments or countries or people. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, generating fake news. Yeah. And you can think even like trying to, uh, you could fine tune it to uh, try to, to uh, yeah, try to promote an agenda that, um, yeah, to, to, to try to tr either to uh, create inflammatory content or, um, yeah, propaganda, totally. What do you think? Yeah, impersonation. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, Michael. Totally. Yeah, so uh, just repeating for the, the recording, someone writing their master's thesis with, with GPT-3 um and yeah like I, I don't know if that i don't know if, if that would pass peer review but you know like a sixth grade essay like gpt3 could probably do it in fact uh it people have used uh gpt3 to write essays and do their homework and uh have done pretty well doing so and so i i guess maybe the ethical question there is is that a bad thing um and um yeah, I'll, I'll leave you to think about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is it unethical to use language models to do good things and pass it off as your own work. Um, and I, 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 there's a, kind of a deeper discussion with that of like how much, um, yeah, personal effort is going into these things. Like it probably took quite a bit of personal effort to, to get T, GPT-3 to work on that particular task. Maybe, or maybe it didn't, I don't know. But, or s s some of this AI generated art, um, it, it, there is kind of an art sometimes in prompt, in prompt engineering to generate like the a beautiful piece of artwork or uh, a persuasive piece of writing with GPT-3. So yeah, interesting questions. Yeah, Dane. Totally. Yeah. So the question is, uh, what are what are the, the positives? Um, how, how can we use these things for good? And I think there's also a question uh, a question of, um, yeah, like is it is it really possible to stop the negative applications? And um, yeah, do you want to spend your time developing these technologies in the first place? Um, because it seems that. Yeah, inevitably, once they are released, they are going to be used for bad. But yeah, let, let's let's turn the turn this discussion around and talk about some of the ways that uh, you think that we could use these things for good. Yeah, Grant. Yeah, so I don't know if you've heard of it, but there is a, a model based on GPT three uh, used for programming that is incredibly good and I think has been shown to improve improve the productivity of software engineers by. Uh, two to three times yeah um what else
Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you could you can almost these really good text models. You can almost liken them to like Google, where you're they're just putting information at at an an autocomplete away from your fingertips, um, from information on programming to dynamical systems. Totally. Yeah. What do you think? Grammarly, yeah, helping. Totally. All, rather than replacing human ability, augmenting hum, human ability to uh, write with better grammar, um, rephrase things in ways that are more persuasive. Yeah, what do you think? Yeah, predicting future health based on, on past health. Yeah. Yeah, what do you think? Totally, yeah. I, I think that's the basic te technological argument of, yeah, the more we can take away the burden of the menial tasks, the, better, the more we can focus on the more abstract tasks of, yeah, coming up with interesting research problems and experiments to test those. And the more of uh, those menial tasks that can be uh, made easier or automated, the, the more we can move on to, to higher level problems, yeah. Totally, giving giving non-native English speakers better access to English, yeah, and help or help helping them phrase phrase their ideas in a more universe uh, a language that's more universally understood. I yeah, love it. So yeah, I definitely encourage you to think hard as you uh, think whether you want do you want to be the person uh, designing GPT, um, knowing that that it can be used for good and bad. Um, that's a decision that's up to you. Um, you can definitely take technology that already exists and use it for good. And I think we've heard a lot of great ideas uh, on, on that note. And I encourage you to, yeah, just always, yeah, think, think adversarially, think about the ways in which the technology you develop can be used for good and bad. And also think about how you can use existing technology for good. Um, Lost my train of thought, but we will move. We will move on. Oh yeah, and then the I remember my train of thought. So just yeah, and then a, kind of a, another more spiritual note on that. Um, I encourage you to to think about um, yeah, like the what it, what is the best way to prevent negative negative use of these technologies, and I think. A great way, a great foundation, moral foundation for those is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so the more people who are choosing of their own volition to do things for good, I think um, the, the better technology can be, will, will be used for good as well. Okay, so um, this is just one uh, last kind of fun transformer example before we move on. It's called the music transformer. Uh, it's trained on uh, MIDI files, which are uh, music note files, and this these are attention maps of what the network is looking at when it is looking to predict the next note, and each different color corresponds to a different attention head. So, yeah, can you see anything, any patterns uh, from where you are um, of what what things the different attention heads are are paying attention to. Yeah, Jacob. Interesting. Yeah, it looks like mainly what it's what most of the attention heads are looking at is the melody. Interesting, which is that top line. Yeah, what else?
Yeah, it looks like this blue attention head might have might be specializing in chords or something like that, or chords that are uh, two measures back. Um, this orange head looks like it's looking at chords that are only a couple of notes back. Um, so just kind of inter interesting view looking at the specialization of multiple heads in a transformer. And this is how it sounds. For those who might be familiar with uh, classical music, any guesses on what composer this was probably trained on? I I'm thinking it's Chopin. It sounds very chopin -y to me. Lots of, lots of grace notes. <laughs> but yeah, so that's kind of a, a cool example. All right, so that is it for GANs. Or that, sorry, that is it for transformers. Now we are moving on to GANs. Oh, actually, I think we have a quick quiz. Uh, so quick, turn to your neighbor, see if you can answer uh, these questions about the shapes of attention matrix and attention matrices in the transformer. All right, what does the encoder attention matrix, matrix, what are the dimensions of the encoder attention matrix? Yeah, L1 by L1. How about the decoder cross attention matrix? L2 by L1, that is correct because you have the output by the input. And then how about the decoder mask attention matrix? So the decoder mass attention matrix, which is, um, what is the size of the input to the decoder? Going to be, yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. So the input to the decoder is L2 plus one by D. Um, in this case, we're just calling L2 plus one L2. And so in the decoder self-attention, the mass self-attention, the, the correct answer is L2 by L2. Okay. All right, so now we are going to start in on GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks. Okay, so this is just a brief video kind of going, giving us a snapshot of, uh, yeah, where we're headed with this, uh, generation of highly realistic images. So this problem of generative modeling, um, 
is a little bit is quite a bit different, I would say, than previous tasks we have tackled in this class. Previous tasks have taken as a, a certain a certain input and produced an output, and um, we've trained the network to map the input to the given output. But how would you what what even would be the input to a network that generates uh, very realistic images of people? Um, so another example, we're going from text to image synth synthesis. Um, so this is a, an example where we would have an input and an output, but it turns out that just doing supervised learning uh, of this problem is not the best uh, approach. So we, the problems we have dealt with so far have mostly been discriminative. So we want to predict why given X. And usually there's kind of some implication in that task that the space of X's is much larger than the space of Y's. For example, um, if we're doing image captioning, there are many more configurations of pixels that could result in uh, the caption. There, there are many, represent, many combinations of pixel, pixel values that could result in the label, man riding a bike. Um, so from, for the next couple of weeks, we're going to be look at, looking at generative problems. Rather than um, classifying uh, or discriminating probability of y given x, we want to reason over the distribution, the joint distribution x, y. Um, and yeah, the advantages of that are Number one, we don't have to have labels. When we're, re when we're looking at the joint distribution, we can do really powerful things with, um, with completely unlabeled uh, data sets. Speech synthesis, um, yeah, uh, generating images, et cetera. So um, there have been many approaches uh, to this generative modeling problem. Um, these are a few of them. Today we're talking about GANs. These are some of the uh, mainstream approaches in 2022. Um, we're starting with GANs, but kind of what, what's in vogue is uh, these days are diffusion models. We, we took a look at stable diffusion in the first couple of days of, of class. Um, you also have autoregressive generative models, flow-based generative models, and uh, variational autoencoders. So um, <clears throat> with a generative model, P of X, um, and you can think of, uh, I say P of X, but X can be a vector. And so P X, y, X comma Y, P com X comma Y comma Z. Um, yeah, when, re when reasoning about joint probability distributions, we have two different problems. Uh, sampling, which is where we want to uh, generate some x from the distribution p of x weighted by the probability of of that um, of that item so for example in case of generating images we want to generate images that have re reasonably high probability and um and if we follow that then we will probably never generate an, an image that's all gray noise um, so sampling is one task then another task is exact log likelihood computa computation. So that, the way log, log, log likelihood computation works is you already have a sample x and you want to know p of x. So um, there are, it's, I, I think this is a good framework for thinking about generative models. There are these two problems, sampling and log likelihood and exact log, log likelihood computation. And certain models are good at sampling, and some are good at log likelihood computation, and some are good.